All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is lecture nine, Ajax. And yes, so I'm here advertising my other course today. This is CS50. Uh, the TFs in that class uh, put together a whole line of apparel for the students. We have about 300 students. It's a very intense class, very memorable. Undergrads like to have their t-shirts, so we now run store.cs50.net. Um, and you can buy, besides this t-shirt here that I'm modeling, sweatshirts, hoodies, uh, cups, boxers, uh, teddy bears and mugs and a whole bunch of other stuff with our brand from that course. We haven't put as much time into the branding of this course, um, but in that one it has a bit of a, a legacy for that reason. So uh, without further ado, uh, Ajax. So tonight is about making websites more dynamic. So we've been on this trajectory. We started very early on talking about uh, HTML and CSS and PHP, and we had a very rudimentary database. We used XML from a call for project one, and that was because we didn't know much about s databases, we didn't know much about SQL or MySQL, plus it was just a very heavy-handed solution to throw a MySQL database at some pizza place down the road. So we used XML. Well, now we're actually going to come full circle this week and next and start using, albeit optionally, XML again as a transport uh, mechanism, moving data from server to client so that clients can request more data of the server, but we'll also offer as an alternative to XML something called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, and even just XHTML itself. All three of these formats can be used via this technology called AJAX. So there's actually a reason that we've taken to uh, lower casing the word AJAX for some time. It was capital A, capital J, capital A, capital X, AJAX, asynchronous, JavaScript, and XML. But the reality is that you don't need to use XML anymore, and in fact, it's actually, I I think personally a lot easier just to use XHTML or JSON for that last letter. So we lowercase it these days because it's really meant to describe now uh, a range of approaches. But how about in layman's terms? What is AJAX? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. That's all, that's all, right? In very casual terms, it's the ability for a browser these days to fetch more data from the server and integrate it fairly seamlessly into the interface without the user seeing a whole entire page reload, without having to get every element from the page, again, just to update some portion thereof. So years ago, if you wanted to update the web page, you, you could do something like meta refresh, which is a little tag in the head of a page, which would force the page to reload every some number of seconds. And even I use that, frankly, still from time to time. If I just want to get something done quickly and dirtily, you can force the page to reload. But the downside of this is that you have another entire HTTP request that gets everything again, even if just one piece of data has actually changed. Case in point, this website that I've put together um, in several different forms over time that we use in this other course as demonstration, uh, for demonstration purposes, if I want to go from Harvard's Quad, which is up the road, to the cemetery out here on the shuttle bus, you get output like this. And I, the first time I implemented this, just really didn't want to sort of engineer it with Ajax in mind. It's meant to be very simple. You come to this, you click, click, done. So if you actually watch this long enough, the whole page will, in fact, refresh every 60 seconds or so. And because I hypothesize that it's not going to be that disruptive of an interface, because in theory, a user comes to a site like this, they glance at it, they get the time, and if it reloads the whole page, eh. So be it. But again, in this world of mobile devices where every little byte counts and every HTTP request counts, well, these things start to become a nuisance. So in fact, on my to-do list this coming week or next week is going to be to rip out that very lazy uh, meta refresh approach and just replace it with a little bit of AJAX. And in fact, I can do that very easily using some of the tools that we'll talk about today. And I'm, I'm trying, there we go. So now you can catch this shuttle. But it was, a, it was a tiny little flicker because most of the page stayed the same. But if you notice the little spinning icon somewhere in the browser, the whole page did, in fact, reload. So I, I just want to get rid of that. And thankfully, after tonight's lecture, I'll know how. So Ajax is all about grabbing more data from the server so that you can integrate, again, updates more seamlessly. And one of the best examples, I think, to this day is this website, which I think I've pulled up before, kayak.com. If we want to search for, uh, let's say, a flight, out of here, from here to say LAX. Uh, I don't really care where it goes, but notice very quickly did that calendar on the right hand side appear. And I just typed in an arbitrary airport. So maybe Kayak was smart, remembered my past search, or maybe it just preloaded all possible flights from Boston to wherever. But I'd conjecture that it's actually being a little more clever. Let me try SFO and hit tab, and it, all of a sudden it updated itself again. 
let me try another one, JFK, to get to New York, it seemed to update itself again. So it seems like it's actually grabbing more and more data from the server because it seems unreasonable to suppose that it has downloaded in advance all possible flights everywhere. There are just some problems where that's just not feasible. It's just stupid to take that approach. So here's a really nice use of Ajax, and that's just on the front page. Frankly, years ago when this first debuted, I personally stopped using Orbitz and Travelocity and Expedia because this one, frankly, just kind of one-upped it. Um, and now, you know, there's more of this stuff out there, so it's perhaps not as uh, sexy anymore. But this was a wonderful example of really pushing the limits of Ajax. So if I watch this long enough, I'll get a whole bunch of flights here. I can click these various filters on the left-hand side. And the whole page does not refresh, thereby potentially annoying me, the user, but rather things update in line. And that's thanks to Ajax. Yeah? <laughs> um, how, internally, how does this work? Uh, stay tuned for tonight's lecture. So, so we'll get there. Right now, we're just trying to amaze you, if, if nothing else. So and again, another canonical example of this, which um, you are now getting acquainted with yourself, is Google Maps, which totally blew out of the water. MapQuest and Yahoo a few years ago. And now everyone's kind of hopped on this bandwagon where you can drag and drop most everything. But this was very novel at the time, being able to search for one Oxford Street, uh, 02138 Enter. And then if you actually want to drag around, you can actually do things like this. And clearly, the uh, website did not download every possible graphic for the entire Earth. So it's presumably getting this data on demand. And we can see this, especially in uh, our little web developer friendly browser. So I pulled up Firefox here. Any guesses as to what, I'm, what tool I'm going to open? OK, so Firebug would work too. I'd see it there. For something like this, where I just kind of want to prove to myself that there's some HTTP traffic, I'm going to use the live HTTP headers. But there's any number of tools that work that we've even recommended. Let's do it again. 1 Oxford Street, 02138, enter. So I'm not even going to care what's going on back there. But clearly, a whole lot of HTTP traffic was just generated, for better or for worse. Right? It shouldn't amaze you how much was generated. It should kind of make you sad, frankly, how many requests it took just to update this. But so be it for now. And if I just click and drag, let me go back to the bottom here. I'll clear that output. And just dra the moment I click and drag, it's getting it more and more data. So again, what you'll have ultimately is your own Google map integrated into your own website. But the underlying technology is going to be the same. But the funny thing with Project 3 is that a lot of the AJAX is going to be written for you by Google. So there's two pieces of AJAX involved in Project 3. Uh, one of which is you type in something into your search box, and you hit Enter. And you need to recenter your map around whatever place the user has searched for. Now, per the spec, you're going to be encouraged to use uh, Google's geocoding service, fancy word for converting strings to addresses like latitudes and longitudes. They do that for you. How? They do it by giving you access to a JavaScript API. But what's underneath the hood of that is this thing called AJAX. So we'll actually do some of this from the ground up today. And then, of course, the second piece of AJAX that's going to be involved there is actually getting the data uh, for markers and news articles. And you're going to write that piece yourself from the ground up. So you're going to borrow someone's code for one aspect and write your own for the other. Um, so that's the teaser for where we're going today. So what I wanted to do, what I thought would be interesting to do as we dive into this is to give you a sense, especially as you're thinking about final projects, pre-proposals, hopefully this time came in. Proposals are due soon, per the spec, um, to get you thinking about what you yourself can do for your final project. And what's particularly exciting about dynamic websites these days is I think that they're largely data-driven. right? And why would you bother visiting a website unless it has something interesting to tell you? Maybe it's static. Maybe it's like a. Uh, photographic portfolio or something like that. But most of the websites, if you think about your daily life, kind of you visit because there's new data there, whether it's slash dot news or uh, you know, things going on in the local city or whatever the website it is, it's probably data driven. And so this is one of the APIs that I encourage folks to consider using. If, actually, no. This did not exist last week. This is new. But this is from our little fun APIs page that I encouraged you last week to take a look at for your own final projects. If you want to come up with some fun idea and integrate data into your site, what kinds of data might you draw upon? Well, there is a number of Harvard-specific ones that we ourselves um, have been working on on campus. And a student actually asked me, 
um, since in this other course they're also working on final projects, very similar in spirit, albeit with some different technologies, they'd love to make some kind of dining hall application where you can find out when your favorite foods are being offered. What days this week can I eat pizza in the dining hall? Can you even text message me to tell me to go to dinner that night because it's pizza? So silly things like that, but nonetheless compelling and requires using all of these kinds of technologies that we've been and have, will start talking about. So I offered to lend these guys a hand. So this is the website that Harvard's uh, Dining Services uses to pro uh, propagate the dining hall menu. And it's not bad. It's actually pretty good these days. They recently updated it. You can get nutritional information. You can add things to like a little shopping cart and it'll tell you like how much weight you'll gain or whatever based on the data they have in their database. For what we cared about, at least for now, was just what's being served for breakfast, what's being served for lunch, what's being served for dinner. So I glanced at this website, sort of on behalf of these students, because I started thinking, you know, how could we get this data? And I figured if we try to uh, formally do this by hooking into their database and all that, never going to happen. Certainly not anytime soon. It just involves too much work, too many people, uh, too much coordination. But this is out there on the web, so there's no reason we can't screen scrape this data. And this is not generally recommended practice. And thus far in the course, we've pretty much preached and pushed you towards machine-readable formats. So the CSV files for Yahoo Finance. Uh, the XML files for Project 3's RSS feeds and Google's own API. But the reality is, especially for final projects, sometimes the world is not so clean. And many of you may very well decide to resort to screen scraping. So a quick definition. What does it mean to screen scrape? Or web scraping. Apparently, people call it on Wikipedia. I've always called it screen scraping. Yeah. Okay, good. And that's actually a more sophisticated answer than is often the case. So it's this ability to take a web page, convert it into a DOM, which we'll again discuss today, though we've had a teaser of this in our XML discussions, and kind of navigate the, tree, the nodes in that DOM tree and grab the data you want. I would actually take a step back and propose that a lot of the time people just resort to those things called, what's that? Uh, so tags or regular expressions, which you can implement in any number of languages where you just search for patterns in the HTML source code, right? Any of us can, anyone in the world can just right click on this page, view the source, and it might be a little overwhelming at first, but odds are if this is database driven itself, odds are there's a pattern here. And just the fact that everything's consistently indented, albeit messily, I mean that's actually kind of promising because it suggests that there's a pattern, and if there's a pattern, I can exploit that pattern and actually parse it. What do we mean by parse? Well, thus far, we've used regular expressions pretty simply, like to validate an email address or to make sure a name is not blank. But you can extend those basic building blocks of checking for digits, checking for numbers, checking for white space, and actually look for the tag whose, uh, whose name is div, the class whose name, or whose name is h1. So if I just kind of look at this, let me take a look at the actual thing here. So not that I would want to eat this, but leek and apple soup. I'm going to go ahead and view the source. Do a little command F. All right, so there it is, leek and apple soup. So how might I get at this data? Well, if I were to parse this file by hand, which is not a very scalable solution, I would, for instance, highlight something like that, copy paste into an Excel file, and voila, I can give everyone CSV data, which is wonderful. But we need to be able to automate this somehow. So what strikes you as maybe a nice, Something, some, what piece of structure here could we exploit? What seems to be part of the structure of this page? What tags could we look for? What's that? Yeah, menu item. So I see div class menu item, a couple of lines above, and then that div closes, and that's inside of a menu, oh, sorry, this is item wrap inside of menu item. Let's see if this actually is a pattern here. Let me uh, scroll down, sausage minestrone soup, OK, that's inside menu item. That's inside of item wrap. Let's scroll down further. Uh, under salad bar, applesauce is in. OK, so here already, it's still a bit messy. right? Unfortunately, there's no tag that just says item, minestrone soup, close item. So it's going to be a little more sophisticated than that. But the fact that there's this pattern is great. So I could use regular expressions. And I could come up with some crazy thing using preg match where I'm looking for for instance, uh, open bracket div, and then dot, dot, dot. Right? You'd imagine a really long regular expression. And frankly, this is what most people have done for years, regular expressions. Or you somehow analyze the page top to bottom, left to right. But we, at least even in this course, learned something a while ago that you were hinting at that might let us parse this data more effectively. What might that query language be? 
Any thoughts? X-Path. Yeah, so XPath. So it probably was a little eh, kind of here or over here early on in the course in terms of going over one's head because we used it fairly simply early on and it was a lot to grasp at first, but it really boils down to being able to execute these sort of path-based queries where you say, give me this element, then this child, then this child. Oh, wait filter by this attribute, then keep going, then keep going. And now if we have this exact structure, a div with an attribute of class whose value is menu item, inside of which is a child called div who's got an attribute of item wrap. I mean, hopefully, if you recall that project still, there's a pattern that you can embody inside of an XPath expression itself, which makes it so much easier to screen scrape, because you can literally view this page as a big hierarchical tree, like you did long ago with XML, and just dive right into those fields that you want. So just to make this slightly more clear, let me go ahead and uh, just jot down real fast something I just said. So if I'm saying something like I could have the XPath function, and uh, what do I want? I want to do something like, well, I want to find somewhere in the page. I'll be a little lazy here, but we can always optimize later. So this is descendant or self. Anywhere in the document, find me a div whose attribute called class is menu item. Something like, whoops, something like that. Let me make my window a little wider and shrink this down just a little bit. Then inside of that is a bunch of children, but one of those children I think is another div whose class is, anyone recall already? Yeah, item wrap. And so we, in this way, let's see how much further we want to dive in here. There's a span, and then there's an anchor tag. So it looks like I then want to do span A. And maybe there's a little more thought that has to go, in on, go into this. But notice that we kind of have the essence of it. Go find me a div that's of type menu item, then find its child whose class is of type uh, item wrap, then dive into this span, then dive into the A, and what am I going to get? I'm going to get the word applesauce or minestrone soup or whatever it is. If I then go back here, recall that this gives me, uh, let's say, this gives me a whole bunch of A tags because recall that XPath returns an array. Well, if I just want the first of those, I can later say something like A, uh, tag gets a tags bracket zero, right? But this is just sort of basic PHP syntax at this point. Get back an array, you want the first one. Getting the zeroth is one way of doing that. So long story short, all that stuff we talked about early on for accessing the pizza ML database, we can kind of now exploit even later in the semester and in real world projects to grab data we care about. But there's a huge assumption here. What is that assumption? Uh, uh, okay. Um, say, I heard two things at once. So that the structure is going to remain the same. So that's a huge problem, actually, because if Harvard's Dining Services decides, eh, it's Halloween, let's change the appearance of our website, my screen scraper breaks on October 31st. If they overhaul their site completely, it's going to break in perpetuity. So this is sort of a cat and mouse game. Anytime a website changes the structure of their document, you need to race to catch up with it if you care about your own uh, screen scraper continuing to work. <laughs> Yeah, so you have to hope that the website itself is well-formed XHTML and thus XML compliant because if you don't have that uh, well-formed XML and thus XHTML, you are not going to be able to use XPath at all because you don't have a well-formed tree. So let's cross our fingers here. Let me go ahead and copy this URL. Let me go to w, uh, w, uh, validator.w3.org and go ahead and paste in this URL and check. Damn it. <laughs> so this is one of those things where, aha, now though you might be wondering, why do I have to bother making my pages transitional compliant and all this when clearly the browsers, browsers render them the same, there is something to be said for standards. Now that's not to say that you should be getting your pages to validate as XHTML just so that other people can screen scrape your data and take, steal your data, but there is something to be said for conforming to standards, and here's one of the reasons. Now, there are a lot of problems here. <laughs> um, not all of these are individually problematic. Frankly, I see mentions of they didn't escape their ampersands, it seems, and actually, let's see if we're being too unfair. Let me look at the source code real quick. Let's see what doc type they claim. Yeah, so they're being completely, uh, Completely ingenuous here. This is not compliant uh, XHTML transitional because a whole bunch of problems. And let's see if we can't find the faults ourselves uh, just by glancing at, let's say, the first of these. Okay? So why is this error here happening that I've highlighted in blue? 
They also misspelled length, which is also sad. But <laughs> C data. Uh, elaborate. What do you mean? Good. It, it feels like, because it's tripping over this semicolon, it feels like it's choking because this must be inside of a PC data section that is not inside of a uh, bracket, bang, uh, bracket, C data, bracket section, which would say, analyze this for JavaScript, but don't parse it, or don't try to parse it as valid XHTML. So that's probably an easy fix. So you can fix the typographical error. And maybe I might be, a, it could be actually, uh, let's be fair. It looks like the W3C site is, for some reason, not showing us the H. It sounds like they might have gotten it OK per this next line. So maybe it's not a typo there. But the semicolon pr uh, suffix to length, it's tricking the browser into thinking, oh, L-E-N-G-T-H semicolon is some kind of entity. Wait a minute, I don't know what that one is, even though there's no ampersand. So long story short, very simple fix. Just put this JavaScript code in a C data section. Let's see what else is here. Oh, so this is interesting. Same problem, probably. It's, getting, it's choking on the ampersands now. It's probably because it's not in a C data section. Let's scroll down further. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of these, right? Th at first glance, this might be ridiculously overwhelming that you can't even scroll through this fast enough to find all of your errors. But they could be the result of really the same thing. So this is definitely fixable, you would hope, hopefully with just a few changes. Now, for us, this, this sucks, right? Because now I have to go through and fix their code manually before I can even parse it, right? This is almost a non-starter at this point. And frankly, the number of websites out there that are actually XHTML compliant is probably fairly low. And I'll admit that I'm sure sometimes our own CS75.net website itself is not compliant because we make a quick update in the middle of the night. We don't think to go to the validator to make sure we didn't screw something up. So even ours probably is not always valid. It's not necessarily that easy to maintain this stuff. And the most common mistake, frankly, is to include ampersands in URLs inside of href tags that are in your website, you have to convert those to ampersand AMP semicolon, which is just annoying, frankly, if nothing else. So with that said, is there a solution? Well, thankfully, OK, so I just spoiled the answer. Is there a solution? <laughs> so yes. Anyone know what it is? Is there a, a robust solution to this? Any thoughts, tools you've used before? Oh, good. So we're all about to learn something. That's good, because otherwise it's a big setup for nothing. All right, so what is this? Well, there's this little command line program for years called Tidy. Um, it's now a uh, SourceForge project. Tidy used to be just a command line program that you could run at the command line and run your HTML code through it. And it would just tell you, for instance, is it invalid? Does it not comply with some various DTDs? Or even irrespective of doc types, it will just tell you you forgot to close this tag or you forgot to quote this string, stuff like that. So it's fairly pedantic, fairly anal, tells you what you seem to have done wrong. But now it also exists in library form, PHP form even. And we actually installed it on the server so that, um, this, that this website is running on so that we ourselves could use it programmatically in PHP. So I wrote a few lines of PHP code that use file get contents to grab that URL of the dining services website. I then call a couple of tidy related functions that take in an XML or almost XML string as input. And then output, guess what? Valid XHTML. Now, it's not going to be 100% reliable. If your website's a complete train wreck, odds are it's not going to be able to save you from yourself. But if it's just a few stupid things here and there, a few tags aren't closed properly, some C data sections missing, it works wonders. And in fact, it did exactly that for me. What I was able to do to screen scrape this data was I grabbed just the raw XHTML using file get contents in PHP. I passed it through Tidy. Tidy then handed me a tidied string that is now valid XHTML. Guess what function I pass that then to? A few different answers here. Uh, uh, so not just not XPath just yet. I first need to do what in PHP? Uh, sorry, simple XML. So I have to call simple XML load string or new simple XML element, one of those two approaches. But long story short, load it into a DOM that in-memory tree-based representation of it, which it can now do without returning false because I'm passing it valid XML or well-formed XML, thus uh, XHTML as well. 
So what is that, what am I then able to do? Now I'm just able to use my XPath query. So that took a little trial and error. I had to look at the source code and figure out what patterns is the website using. And I went with exactly the same intuition as you. Find the item wrap uh, classes, find the menu item classes, and see if I can't extract the data that way. And then I also realized that these things come in categories. So you see in boldface, today's soup, salad bar, and there's some other categories. So I also had to make my thing a little more sophisticated later, where I iterate over all of the elements, and I keep track of the most recent category I saw, so that I can also bucketize all of the food elements into these various categories. But the end result is a cron job. A cron is a program that exists on Linux and Unix machines. It allows you to run any program you want on a specified schedule. So I have a cron job running at like midnight every night. Uh, that is just uh, the path to a script I wrote in PHP that contacts the server, queries for this URL that we've been looking at here, grabs the invalid XHTML, tidies it up, loads it into a DOM, uses some XPath to get the data, then inserts all of the data I just screen scraped, so to speak, into my own MySQL database, where now it's nice and clean and I can maintain it as I see fit. And I do this a few times because you might notice that every time I click breakfast, lunch, or dinner, watch the topmost URL, even though it's a little small, there's a parameter that changes there. You see what's changing? It's a little small. Yeah, so meal. Apparently, whatever, whoever wrote this website decided that breakfast would equal 0, lunch would equal 1, dinner would equal 2. And that's great. So I had to hard code this into my script, too. And if they ever change that, again, it's going to break. But just using my basic, some basic understanding of get strings and how parameters work, I can now mimic three clicks on this web page. And in fact, I then realized I don't have to wait until today to get the menus. Because notice on the left-hand side, they have links to future menus. So I clicked on, let's say, Tuesday. And now if you notice here, it's a little small. But notice it apparently supports a date attribute. Date equals 11-17-2009. I know how to generate things like that with PHP, the date function or whatever. And I can now also get things into the future. So the end result for our purposes was to create a wrapper for Harvard Dining Services website that we can expose to students in this class, students in the other class, as an API so that they don't have to deal with what, frankly, is not all that intellectually enlightening. If the students in that class just wanted to make something interesting with dining hall menus, well, now they can, using a much um, cleaner API than this screen scraping approach. Now, granted, my approach still relies on screen scraping, but at least they have a layer of abstraction between them and that data set. So how did I expose this, and what kinds of data sets can you also play with if you so choose? Uh, this isn't the only one, but I decided that we would implement what's called a RESTful API. So REST is another one of these buzzwords that really just describes very simple uh, APIs via which you can get data by querying URLs. And you get back data in CSV format or what's called JSON format, more on that tonight, or even PHP format. You can take a PHP object or associative array and serialize it in such a way that what is in memory normally can get uh, written out as a really long cryptic looking string that you can then email around or send over the internet and then reload into memory by unserializing it. So we have a few different formats. So what we now tell students in this class and in that class, well, if you want to ask for food related data, query food.cs50.net slash search question mark the date you want the meal you want, and we ditched the whole 0, 1, 2 thing, which just felt a little hackish. So we just say, give us, say breakfast or lunch or brunch or dinner in that field, and we'll take care of the details of the numbering. And then output equals something, where right now we support CSV or JSON or PHP. And so the end result uh, is something like this. So here's the CSV file. Here's a sample from the day I wrote this documentation. We send them back a CSV file, with the first row of which uh, are the field names, so that they know what's what. And rows one onward are all of the things that they selected. So what's the point here? Now, most students in this class probably don't really care so much about what's being served in the dining halls on campus. But this is an example of solving a very real world problem. You need data from some other data source. It's publicly available already, but it's just not machine readable. How can you go about parsing that data? 
just knowing these basic building blocks, all of which we knew tonight, except for maybe the tidy detail, is really empowering, I think, and can let you do some really neat things. So if you do want to play with these data sets, even if you don't care about what's for dinner or lunch, but just want data to play with, know that we've done the same thing with Harvard's events on campus, the maps on campus, news on campus, tweets on campus, um, and shuttles on campus. They all support very similar APIs. Um, if you click too soon, you will get um, uh, slightly underwhelming, come on, <laughs> documentation. So when there's interest, I'll fill in the blanks. Um, first, you have to tell me that you care about some of these APIs. Any questions about screen scraping or uh, REST-based APIs? No, and we did have this buzzword once before. So Twitter's own API is RESTful in that they, too, support a very simple API. You don't download library code. You don't download interfaces or anything like that. They just tell you. I request URLs in this form, you'll get back this data. Request URLs in this form, you'll get back this other data. It's very common. What's nice is very much language and platform neutral. And you don't have to write code for other people to use and thus maintain. You just give them the URLs and let them use any language that they want. Yeah? Is, um, is this going to take the place or just, I don't know, take the place, but there's also uh, web services? Yeah. So there's web services, there's protocols like SOAP, uh, XML, RPC. These are all very similar in spirit, much heavier handed solutions. So actually for years I taught a class that was on Java and XML at the extension school and we used to use uh, XML, RPC and SOAP and they are sort of protocols unto themselves that have some advantages, one of which is data types. What you don't get in CSV files is any notion of whether this is a string or a float or an int. So you lose some of that information potentially in SOAP and other other uh, transport mechanisms like that actually specify, here comes a string, here comes an int. Um, so you lose that with this approach, too. Um, and this, too, is a little more homegrown. The nice thing about using a protocol like SOAP, which happens to be XML-based, is that you can leverage a lot of libraries and toolkits that know how to send and receive messages in that form. But it's just another approach to this. RPCs have been around for years, usually proprietary, now a little more open-ended. REST is becoming, I'd say, even more popular these days because it's just so simple. Right? Request a URL, bam, you're done. And you've seen in Project 2 with Yahoo Finance just how easy it is to access CSV data if you can just pull the data down. So maybe, yes, I think, frankly, I love APIs like this because the learning curve and barrier to entry is so low. Yeah? So the there's this sort of an unofficial API, right? An API is a bit, um, especially in Yahoo's case, is a bit generous because it's not even documented. That's really just a download link that has the side effect of also being machine parsable. It's been there for years, so it's sort of a de facto API that they provide, even though they have no formal documentation itself. That's why we refer you to that gummy website or whatever the URL was that some nice person put together. But yeah, essentially, that's precisely the same spirit. Other questions? OK, so how, once we have data, what can we start doing with it? Well, um, a quick, oh, damn, forgot to fix this slide again. I borrowed this from that previous lecture and fixed. Or you can view that as an example of invalid XHTML. OK, so what is AJAX all about and how can we do it? Well, again. It boils down to being able to query for more data from client to server, making additional HTTP requests after the initial one has been made and the little globe or whatever in your browser has stopped spinning. So when you get back this data, for now just assume you can request more data and you're not getting full-fledged XHTML. You're not getting another HTML element, another head element, another body element. You're generally going to get subsets of that information, maybe a few more divs, or maybe not. Maybe you're just getting back CSV data or something similar. You can request CSV data via AJAX as well, though less common. What's going to be the goal? Well, the goal is going to be to start with a web page like this. This is now valid XHTML. Then I fixed that little bug. And the goal of AJAX ultimately is to insert new nodes into your original DOM, or remove old DOM, uh, nodes, or update old nodes. So AJAX is all about updating the in-memory tree representation. And what's nice is that the browser realizes the moment you edit the DOM by adding, inserting more data here or removing this data, the visualization of that DOM immediately changes. Hence, you get these, these seamless user interfaces, AJAX uh, 
Kayak's website automatically updates itself as soon as you start manipulating this in memory. So that begs the question, how can you manipulate this in memory? Well, there's going to be a few ways. Um, first, a couple of tidbits or hints on where to find out more about some of this stuff. So some good DOM references uh, are going to be those here. But I will caution that though we'll look at all of the various mechanisms for using AJAX, XML, JSON, and XHTML, I would say that, frankly, one of the most annoying is to use the DOM-based approach or really the XML-based approach. So long story short, the W3C did a really nice job of standardizing how you can edit an in-memory representation of a web page. There are some language-neutral DOM functions like add child and remove child and all of these very generic functions with which you can manipulate trees like this. But they're very verbose, the functions, and they're not very user-friendly. And one of the reasons uh, uh, APIs like jQuery have gotten so, or libraries like jQuery have gotten so popular is that they simplify operations like these. So for the most part, we'll look at all three of these mechanisms, but largely promote um, JSON and XHTML for their simplicity. And they just get the job done. So what's at the core of AJAX? Well, there's this special object. So in JavaScript, there are things like a date object, there's a string object, and there's a bunch of other types of objects that exist that you sort of get for free with the language. Well, along the way, the world invented the XML HTTP request object. So it's kind of annoyingly named. Um, there's various documentations for it, because each of the various vendors kind of took slightly different approaches. But thankfully, this object supports some uh, functionality across all of the browsers that you can assume. This is the object that allows you to make additional connections from client to server. So, so long as your browser knows what this object is, you can use AJAX to grab additional data. So what methods exist within this library? So there's bunches of methods that exist for the date class or object in JavaScript for the string class. Here are the ones that exist for this object across all browsers. Um, we won't go into great detail about all of these. We'll see them rather in practice. But it's fairly simple. It really boils down to like th four or five. There's an abort, which just means stop this AJAX connection. There's open, which means open a connection to a server. There's send, which means send your HTTP request via get or post. And then there is. Um, some other things, send, uh, set request header, get all response headers, those you won't tend to use as much. So we're really going to tend to use probably the most common will be this second one, open method URL async. And we'll see by way of example what that all means. But just as a hint, if you need to authenticate against a website, there are ways of doing that as well. So there's also, because this thing's an object, there's not only methods associated with it, with, but properties, pieces of information like a string's length that you can ask for to see what state this object is in. So just to paint the picture here, the goal at hand with our first example is going to be to have a web page, very simple one. It's going to instantiate a new XML HTTP request object. It's going to create a new object of that type. It's going to open a connection to a server using that object. It's going to send a request to that server using that object. It's going to wait for some number of milliseconds or seconds for a response. And when that response comes back, a function called a handler function is going to get executed. And that handler function is going to do something with the response. And the middleman for all of that is, again, this object. So during the process by which all of this stuff is happening, the request going, the, the response coming, we can do some introspection in this object. And we can ask, what state are you in? Well, we can check any number of those ready state values there. The only one ultimately we'll tend to care about is the last. Are you loaded into memory? Is ready state equal equal to four? That means a response has come back and it's ready to be handed to us. But you can infer from the words there. You can also, if you care, check you know, what other states that uh, object is in. Because there's several different steps between here and there and back. But the magic is really going to come back in the two of these. Response text and response XML are going to be the variables inside of which is the response from the server, either in plain text format or, if it's XML, in XML format that is in DOM format, a tree I can navigate. Um, and then there's status. And you can infer probably what this means. Not only can you get data back from the server, you can check what the response code was. 200 is great. 404 means there's nothing that's come back to you that's useful. 403 is bad. 500 is bad. Pretty much anything other than 200 is probably bad. So hopefully you'll check for 200 for status and 4 for ready state. So again, we'll see this in an example in just a moment. 
These are the three MIME types that we might expect back. So XHTML, XML, or JSON. Um, but you can technically send back most any kind of data you want, including just text. All right, so let's take a look at an example here. Let me go into uh, tonight's source directory. Let me open up ajax1.html. So you have this among your printouts. And let me pull this up simultaneously in a browser here. <laughs> ajax1.html. And let me go ahead and fill in this form. So there's a form field here, symbol, Goog. I'm going to click Get Quote. And over here is my little pop-up. And Google, as of 4.30 PM or so today, closed at $576.28. I can keep doing this again and again, but I'll presumably get back that same value since we're pretty much past uh, after hours trading or updates that we'd see so immediately. So interesting, certainly not the most glamorous of web pages, but notice what has not changed about my browser state when I click the Submit button. Yeah, there's no refresh. Right? The URL's not changing. I don't seem to be leaving the page per se. So let's get a little nosy. Let's look at our live HTTP headers. Now let me click Get Quote. Maybe I'm just tricking you and I just hard coded in $576.28. But no, it seems to be sending a request to the server. So what's request was sent? And let's see if we can infer how this thing was implemented. So there's one request and run response. So here is the uh, message that was just sent. So I'm hitting quote one.php, question mark, symbol equals goog. That's the URL that's sent. Here's the corresponding get string that the browser generates. Here's some fluff that's not really useful for right now, just some standard stuff. This is good. The response came back as 200. Um, and then scrolling down, I got back text slash HTML. So I kept this very simple. Now, what was that response? Well, let's again get nosy. And frankly, this is a wonderful way of learning from other websites how they are functioning, especially if, if you want to start grabbing data from a website by mimicking some of its own queries, understanding how they work is exactly what will empower that. So let me go ahead and copy this URL. Let me go ahead and open this in a separate tab. So the URL I'm going to visit now is this one, not the one I typed into my browser to see this very fancy interface, but rather the URL that's being hit apparently behind the scenes thanks to Ajax. So I'm going to hit Enter. And I get back just this. Let's look at the source, at what, I, what I'm getting back. It's apparently just some text. It's just a number. It's a very simple web page. There's no tags even. But I'm apparently then passing this return value to what function upon its return? Alert. So I'm passing it to alert. So certainly we're far from the Kayak interface, but let's see how I did this. So this is ajax1.html. First, let's fast forward to the bottom, and you'll see the simplicity of the XHTML there. There's really nothing interesting here except for a couple things. There's a body, form, some BRs, an input, and the magic appears to be borrowed from our tricks last week where we can intercept a form submission. Last week we did it to validate data and to kind of interrupt the form submission if the data was invalid, if the user was messing around with the inputs. Here I'm apparently calling a function called quote, but I'm always returning false. Now there's a few ways I could have implemented this functionality, but my goal was to induce a call to quote and never let this form actually submit. Because I, the JavaScript programmer here, am going to do the submission for it using Ajax so that the URL never changes. So that then begs the question, or should, what is the quote function? Well, let's scroll up here. And here we go. Quote gets a quote. Oh, let me scroll up slightly higher. So notice at the very top of my script, I have what's essentially a global variable called XHR, uh, XML uh, HTTP request. And I'm initializing it to null. The reason for that, as you'll see, is simply because I want to be able to access that variable in two different functions. So I made it global. It's reasonable. I don't have much code. It's not really bad practice in this case, because it's all so simple. So here's my quote function. So it's a few lines of code. Let's see what's going on. Apparently, these several lines per my quotes are the lines of code that instantiate an XML HTTP request. In other words, if you want access to this sort of new fancy functionality of AJAX, you just have to create one of these objects. Unfortunately, um, the folks at Microsoft and the folks everywhere else never quite kind of saw eye to eye on how you should do this. So we're stuck with this headache of trying one approach. And if it fails, try the other approach. This is actually an abuse of the whole try catch 
uh, construct mechanism because we're essentially using it for logic control here, if else, but it's the only reliable way of doing this. So the try catch approach essentially in Java, in JavaScript and in other languages means try to do something, but if something really bad happens and what's called an exception is thrown, catch that exception so that I can say, hey, something bad happened. But in this case, and is in, as is the case in the real world, you assume in most cases that if the first one failed, it's probably because you're using Internet Explorer. So let's try a different approach, which is to try to act, uh, instantiate an active X object with that parameter there. So it's a bit of a nuisance. It's one of these kind of suck it up, copy paste it for now. But thankfully, and we'll talk about this tonight and next week too, there are libraries that hide some of these cross browser headaches. Yeah. Yes, I believe in. I believe so. In seven. Yes. No. Is this a? Oh, just adjusting your glasses. No, I thought we had a, a head shaking here. Um, <laughs> uh, I believe so. I believe so. Um, frankly, I still do this since um, even I have IE6 for development purposes on a machine. But I, I would think so these days. Um, but for now, I'd say we're still in, the, in a place where doing this is still a good thing. So and even uh, the major libraries do this as well. So at the end of this block of code, we hopefully have in memory a reference to a variable, XHR, to this type of objects, XML HTTP request, inside of which is a whole bunch of methods we can call send, open, and all of that, abort, and also those properties like ready state status, response XML, response text. So hopefully we have this, but if not, you know what, I'm just going to say, sorry, Ajax is not supported by your browser. So it's a bit of a cop out, but I'm at least checking the return value ultimately. So what's really cool though is if I now want to send an Ajax request, it's actually pretty simple. I first have to uh, figure out what URL I want to ask for, and it has to be on my same server, at least for now. So one of the gotchas with Ajax is actually a good security feature, is Ajax queries can only contact the same server from which the JavaScript code itself came. This is what's called the same origin policy. There's kind of sort of workarounds for this, but those of you who have dived into project three will realize that per the spec, you actually have to implement this sort of proxy, a PHP file that itself on the server contacts Google News, grabs the RSS, and then relays it to your website, to your JavaScript code, and that's because of this reason. Your JavaScript code for your mashup for Project 3 is just not allowed by policy to contact Google News directly, because that would be grabbing data from some other website and integrating it to your own, thereby violating the same origin policy. We'll talk more about this kind of stuff toward the end of the semester, but that's actually a good thing, because if you think about it, if a ran an arbitrary web page were allowed to contact other web pages on your behalf, you could wage very clever uh, distributed denial of service, DDoS attacks, whereby a person visits your web page, and then you all of a sudden send out a thousand Ajax queries to some website that you really hate, and they appear to be coming not from that attacker, but from me, because I pulled up the website. So that's one of the reasons for this policy, and one of the reasons you have to jump through a bit of a hoop to get it to work in Project 3. So, yep, yeah, sure. Exactly. 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 Now, the difference with Project 3 using Google is that because the Google API code you're using is coming from their server, per the script tag that you're putting at the top of your page, Google's code is allowed to contact Google.com for more map tiles and for GPS coordinates and all of that. So just realize that same origin refers to where the code is coming from, not necessarily just the URL on the page. So we're not completely screwed by the policy. We can still use other people's libraries like Google's, and Google's library can talk to their own server, which is wonderfully useful. Yeah? Same origin policy. You would. If you try to violate this policy by issuing an Ajax query not to, for instance, quote1.php, but foo.com slash quote1.php, you would, nothing would happen, or you'd get the little broken icon in Internet Explorer saying an error has happened, or you get a little red flag in the corner uh, saying that a security violation has happened. The browser. The brow so the, menu the browser manufacturers have decided collectively that this policy will be enforced. And, and that's the second question. Could you get around that policy by using PHP to do a denial of service? So, um, I mean, since, since you're basically saying through Ajax, saying, okay, we're going to allow you to do this, but you're going to have to just do a lot more work than just. 
So you could circumvent this policy just as you're supposed to for project three by proxying requests through the server, but you're not really covering your tracks in that case as an adversary because then all of the attacks, all of the requests are coming from your server from whence the JavaScript code came. So if you were to try to do this on our CS75 server, what Google sees is all of these requests coming from CS75.net. And in fact, we too get blacklisted all of the time. So as an aside, you will sometimes see intentionally on CS75.net, you will see that um, you get back fake news sometimes, which is deliberate. We give you back fake news because sometimes Google realizes, wow, you must have 140 students querying us simultaneously. We're going to stop answering your queries for a while. So we recognize that. And sort of unbeknownst to you, um, we are intercepting all calls to Google News, caching the results for a few hours to avoid precisely that. But the point is that your attack would appear to be coming from your server or from our server. You're really not covering your tracks in that case. Because what's clever about the uh, same origin policy is that if it didn't exist, I could email out a URL to all the students in this class and say, go to badguy.com. If I wrote some JavaScript code on that website that says, now contact myenemy.com, he would get hammered by all of you, but he would never know that it was my JavaScript code that triggered those requests. Because the JavaScript, again, is a client-side language, which means it's executing in your browser, not on our server. So let me forge ahead, and I'll loop back, say, during break, if, that's, if, I, if I should tell the story again. But we left off here. I just need to construct a URL. So we already know what the URL is going to be, quote one dot PHP, question mark, symbol equals Goog. So I need to make that happen. Well, we did something very similar last week with validation. I'm just going to create a variable called URL. I'm going to hard code in this first part, quote one dot PHP equals uh, question mark, symbol equals. And then I'm going to use my DOM function. So document dot get element by ID. This is a DOM function because it manipulates the DOM. Document is the variable via which we access the DOM in JavaScript and dot value to get at its value. So there, now I have that URL in memory. Now I have to contact it. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to issue an open call here. I'm going to open a connection using get, all caps. I'm going to pass in that URL, because that's the, connect, the URL I want to open a connection to. And the true field there is, denotes asynchronous. There's two modes in which you can contact a server in uh, Ajax, asynchronously or synchronously. Now, usually, people use true there. For asynchronous, that is, after all, the A in Ajax. What is the difference? With an asynchronous connection, you contact the server, and the function send immediately returns. And you, your JavaScript code, can go about your business, doing whatever you want with the website. Because one line prior, you take care to tell this XML HTTP request object what function should be called when the response finally comes back from the server, whether that's 20 milliseconds later or 30 seconds later, if it's a really slow connection. So it's asynchronous in the sense that you can open this connection and send your request, and then bam, this function is done executing. But what function will get called when the response comes back? It's apparently a function called handler. So we'll see that source code in a moment. Synchronous would mean that if I just got rid of this handler code, whoops, uh, oops, I can't do it in this mode. Synchronous would mean I, hmm, Synchronous would mean this. If I set, pass it in false instead of true, this line of code here would take either 20 milliseconds to execute or 30 seconds to execute. But my whole website would hang at that point while waiting and waiting for the response. Now, you might want that behavior, especially if the connection is reasonably fast. But one of the beauties of, uh, of AJAX is that all of this is supposed to be happening asynchronously. You make a request, you make a request, another request, just like Google Maps. And it might not all come back instantaneously, but the moment it does, you fill in that gray spot of Google Maps with the new tile. As soon as the next one comes in, you fill in this blank. So lots of things can be happening essentially in parallel. So um, this will make more sense as we look at this function. So we're going to keep it asynchronous, which means you get back to me when the server's ready. I'm not going to wait for you. You get back to me. So what does the handler function do? Well, this is a very short function down here. It's called handler. It takes no arguments in this case. Because XHR I made global, I can check its properties for two things. If xhr.readyState equals 4, that means the response has been loaded into memory, whatever that means. 
And if XHR status equals 200, that means it was a good response. I didn't screw up my URL. I got a legit response. What am I going to do? Apparently something very simple. Alert xhr.response text. And that's how I get the stock quote displayed on the screen. All this capitalization is important. As an aside, one of the biggest, um, one of the most common mistakes early on with JavaScript is just missing some capitalization of something. So if you see a capital T, you got to write a capital T, as in this case here. Questions? Yeah? So I've always been a big mental block about the asynchronous mm -hmm. on a browser. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Or in a browser, we get to it and this, the browser will just wake up and do something. Exactly. Exactly. So if you're already used to coding in this model of events and listeners, that's what Ajax allows you to do. It's precisely that model. But if you're coming at the course with just, say, a Java background and you didn't actually get to multi-threading, which most students wouldn't, certainly in the first course or two, or if you've never programmed in a multi-threaded environment, you're probably used to thinking synchronously, which means you don't have this, mm, I'll contact you now, you get back to me when you're ready approach. You have, I'll contact you now, and I'll sit here waiting for the return value. So that's the fundamental difference. And if that's not quite clear yet, just take away that the mental model for now should be when you make an AJAX call, you tell it what function to call when the response comes, you open the connection, you send the request, and then you make sure that you implement the function that's supposed to get called when the response comes back. All right, so let's tease with just one thing before we have to change tapes here. Uh, AJAX2.html looks a little something like this. It's again, among your printouts, it looks like this. I'm going to go ahead and type in Goog again. And you can probably guess already how this is going to work. But I'm going to click Get Quote Now. And I'm not going to take this lazy approach of using alerts. I'm actually going to update the actual page. So it's still not very glamorous. I, this is still a, a, a huge stone's throw away from Kayak. But why don't we take our five minute break and we'll take a step toward this cleaner interface in, in five minutes. Okay, so this break was like the break of uh, requests. So I'm going to field several requests, all of which I think are actually academically and, and intellectually and logistically interesting and useful. So the first is this one. Um, this is actually a good FAQ, especially when you're diving into Project 3 and you have some general sense that JavaScript's got to talk to PHP and somehow, but realize that these are very separate languages. They're being executed in very separate places, client versus server or server versus client. And so they can't just talk directly. Any communication between your PHP code and your JavaScript code really has to be wired together yourself. But that's the beauty of today. With Ajax, one can, client, can talk to the other, server. So for instance, if you wanted to pass a variable from the server to the client, from PHP to JavaScript, there's no easy way per se. Rather, the JavaScript code has to ask for that variable in some form. And we can actually simulate this here. A moment ago, I simply used alert to show you on the screen what the response was from the server. But there's no reason that I could not also have used some JavaScript code to store in a local variable that response. Then I could even do some mathematics on it. I could multiply it by 10 shares of Google or whatever I want. So I could do var stock quote gets parse float because the response that comes back, again, is text HTML. I know it's a float because it looks like a float. And I sent the float from quote1.php. So parse float in JavaScript will actually give me back an actual number that I can manipulate as a new number mathematically. But just realize this is how you can wire your data server side to your data client side. You can't really tie them together more cleanly unless you're using various frameworks or libraries. So hopefully that addresses one FAQ. Another one which I also thought would be interesting to reveal uh, is cron. What is cron? Well, you can actually use it on CS75.net and dare say it's quite useful uh, for final projects if you're doing anything where you need to get data on some schedule. So you can do this in Windows too. There's some GUI for doing so. Max, I probably have cron jobs or maybe some WYSIWYG for doing this, but I almost always do this on a Linux environment. And frankly, even I never remember the order of what you're about to see, so I constantly check this Wikipedia article, specifically the bottom. So what you can do on a server like CS75 Finance or your own Linux machine is you can run something like uh, cron tab-e for edit. 
Um, I'll stop short of executing this command because we have a number of internal staff commands that run on a schedule, among them little scripts that send us text messages when we have office hours and things like that, simple reminders, but stuff that interacts with our database. This will open something like Emacs or Vim or Nano, whatever your default text editor is, and which you can type line by line commands that you want to have run automatically on some schedule. So what kinds of lines do I type? Well, this is where the Wikipedia article is enlightening. So you simply write a line like this. This line here means run the script called test.pl every five minutes, every day, every week, every month, every year. That's what all the stars denote. And the slash five means every five minutes. So that's actually kind of shorthand notation. What these fields really mean is this. And frankly, this is one of the best uses of ASCII art I've ever seen. It's so clear. So the first star denotes minute. It's got to be 0 to 59. Second star uh, denotes hour, then day of the month, then, day of the, uh, then month, then day of the week. So using these very simple definitions, you can specify fairly precisely when do you want this command to run, on what schedule. So for instance, our little office hour script that sends us SMSs, I think we run it every minute or every five minutes. We very quickly check a database saying, do you have office hours? Do you have office hours? And it wakes up every minute, goes to sleep, wakes up, goes to sleep. Anytime it realizes, oh, damn, it's time for your office hours, it then executes an if block of code. You can write it in any language. Wikipedia's person wrote it in Perl. Uh, we wrote ours in PHP. That sends an email. And you know how to send emails in PHP. So we send an email, or really an SMS, using some tricks um, that get sent to the TFs in my phone as needed. So very simple and very useful, because you can run things on a schedule like this. Um, there's also some shorthand notation, which you can use. Like, if you don't want to remember what all these stars are, you can just say at midnight, at daily, at weekly, and there's some default values. So wonderfully useful, especially in a Linux environment. And a lot of cron jobs actually run automatically on a typical Linux system, things that rotate your logs automatically, things that update your server via yum or apt-get or something like that. So cron is very omnipresent in the Unix and Linux world, and it can be very useful for user software as well. In fact, um, just to tie this into the previous discussion, how do we actually access or how do we actually keep our own database up to date? Well, again, I said um, with regard to this food API, we maintain our own MySQL database. Well, we run the script, I think it's at midnight every night, just to synchronize with the next six days worth of data and then cache it locally. We don't have to do this, but it means that every time a student requests data from us, we don't have to go screen scrape again. And screen scrape again, we're just caching the results, because we decided that would be a nice optimization. Of course, if they suddenly change the breakfast menu between midnight and midnight the next night, our API might be wrong. So we could uh, scrape it every five minutes, every 10 minutes, but it doesn't feel like they're, <laughs> they rarely, pro they probably order their food long enough in advance that they're not changing the menu at the last minute. So that's our hypothesis for now. Wonderfully useful, though, cron. And feel free. It really frees you to think about, wow, how can I automate certain things so that you're not constantly updating your data set yourself? And the last interesting question that came up um, was about Firebug. So I thought I would simulate a common mistake, let's say in ajax1.html, and see if Firebug can't help me fix my mistake. So let's try a few things here. Um, I am going to do a few things. One, I'm going to uh, comment out this line of code up here, thereby making it not global, because I'm actually going to put it in here now. And I'll put it in here now. And I'm going to save, whoops, save the result. OK. So notice this. This is a problem. Why? I'm sorry? Yeah, so I'm using it later. I'm using it here. So now I have a scoping issue. So that's definitely a problem. Let's see if Firebug can't help reveal that to me. I'm going to also do another very common mistake. I'm not going to capitalize the B in buy or whatever. Some stupid capitalization thing that, frankly, at 2 AM is going to be hard to see, but very common. Um, and finally, is there anything else I might want to send? I'll also change one other thing. Per the documentation for send, you should include null in there if you're not sending a post request. So just as an aside, if you send post, how do you send the post data? It goes in here. You put a variable containing what's essentially post data, which essentially is a really long URL containing lots of ampersands, but it can be of unbounded length, whereas a URL is generally capped somewhere. Or it can be binary data as well. But the spec says put null there. But our old friend Internet Explorer uh, tends to fail if you don't specify null, um, even though this looks perfectly reasonable. So I'm not running IE, so this is moot. But let's go ahead and reload ajax1.html. 
And it, also in this domain, when in doubt, I can't emphasize this enough, as some of you have realized, clear your history constantly if you're worried, if you're chasing down some bug that doesn't seem to exist anymore. All right, so let me go ahead and reload. Uh, command reload refreshes the whole page. And let me go ahead and type in goog, enter. Mm, broken. Try again. Maybe it was me. Enter. So there's a, one takeaway here. Something is changing that shouldn't be. What is happening when I click get quote? What's that? It's clearing the form. And why is it doing that? Can you infer from Firefox's behavior? It's reloading. And I need, see that because of the flicker. So this is actually one of a very common warning side. If you have written some JavaScript code that's supposed to short circuit form submission, but it's apparently submitting nonetheless, it's usually because there's a JavaScript syntax error somewhere. Unfortunately, that's not very specific. But often, all JavaScript code, or some or most JavaScript code, will just break if you've got a syntax error somewhere. And that's one such place. So let's see. The Firebug, again, free extension. Um, there exist very similar things now for Chrome and for Safari built in. Um, as I mentioned to a few folks last week, I tend not to use them because I kind of got comfortable with Firebug first. And I still find that its output's a little cleaner than the others. But try any of these if you would like. Um, I opened up the Firebug. I'm going to go up here to Goog. Um, notice no error yet because I haven't actually executed any JavaScript code that's buggy because I haven't induced the call to the function called quote. Hasn't gotten called yet. Get quote. Damn. So this, too, is another common thing that, unfortunately, Firebug's not so good at detecting. It did detect it. Well, keep your eyes on the bottom left of the screen as I search for something else. It, too, is flickering ever so briefly. So something's going on down there, but I'm just not seeing the error. So let's see if I can't do this. I'm going to try to, I've opened up. Uh, let me be more clear as to what I'm doing. I was in the console, which is where you see errors. I'm now going to click the script tag. And the very first time you run this thing, realize you might have to click the little arrow and choose Enabled. Otherwise, these consoles, because they uh, exact a performance penalty on your site, won't run by default. So I'm going to scroll through my HTML here. And notice if I click the tab, I can, uh, if I click here, I can see all of the JavaScript files loaded. But there's only one. It's all in the HTML file. Let's see if I can't chase this bug down. I'm going to go ahead and put a breakpoint by clicking next to line 34. Because, uh, is that 34? Yeah. Yep, 34 is the try statement. All right, so now I'm going to reload my page. So I start fresh, but notice the breakpoint is still there. I'm going to go ahead and type goog, get quote. OK, cool. Now I have a full fledged debugger in my hands that you might be familiar with from Eclipse or uh, GDB or Visual Studio or whatever. It's a little weird to get used to at first, but hugely helpful. So let's see what's going on. The arrow, the yellow arrow at my breakpoint means execution has paused here. Nothing has executed on that line yet. What's neat on the right hand side, I have that little watch tab. Those are all the variables that are currently in scope. So I can actually click some of these things, like the, this object, which at this point in the story happens to refer to the window. No idea what half of this stuff is. It's sort of browser native stuff, but could be interesting. Could be interesting, like the scroll bar values and all of that. So when we've been using or taking for granted document.something and window.something, the browser knows what's inside those things. And so can you, just by doing some introspection. But XHR is undefined. URL is undefined. Undefined in JavaScript is not even null. It means it has not been set with any value. So there's no notion of. Um, uh, like in C and C++, you would get seg faults if you dereferenced a null pointer. Undefined is even distinct from um, null. It's like PHP. It's not is set. All right, so let me go ahead and click these buttons. This is where I can now control things. If I click the blue arrow, continue, it's just going to keep running, which is going to be probably too fast for me. Uh, I can click this one, which is step into. Not applicable here. Step into means if you've broken on a function call, go into the function and then start stepping through that function. That's mm, not applicable here. So what I really want is this third one, step over. This doesn't mean skip it. This means execute this line and step over it to the next line, number 35. So let me go ahead and click this. OK, it jumped ahead because apparently XHR, did it return a value? Oh, sorry, did this line of code, 36, return a value? I see some yes nods. Why? How do you know? What's that? Yeah, look at this. It's no longer undefined. Inside of XHR now, oh, look at this. Here are some of those methods I mentioned exist. 
Here are some handlers, apparently. So there's some juicier stuff in there. But the point is, it's no longer undefined. So apparently, my browser is AJAX supporting. Now I'm going to do a little sanity check. This line of code 44 should return what value? This expression. False, right? It's a Boolean uh, uh, quality check. So I'm going to step. It jumps over. Now I'm going to construct the URL. Here you can watch what's going on. On the right hand side, URL is undefined. But the moment I click step over, it now has a string value, but something bad happened. What just happened? So it's not terribly enlightening what just happened, unfortunately. But what did happen? It kind of jumped back to the beginning somehow. What's that? Uh, yes. So notice, in fact, we've interrupted the reloading. It's still literally reloading. So why was that? Well, you know, I was actually crossing my fingers that Firebug would be more helpful here. Um, all my only takeaway, unfortunately, in this case, is that there's something wrong on what line. Because line 51 should not have induced a form submission, right? Because that is just a string assignment. So what's the bug in line 51? You saw me create it. All right, so it's apparently the capitalization. So I actually wish that bug were a little more enlightening, because clearly this, the, the console was not as helpful or as red as I would like. But now, OK, let's suppose now I realize, oh, that was stupid. Let me go ahead and fix this. I've still got a couple of other errors. Let's see if fixing this gives me more explicit responses. So let me go ahead and click the red dot, which gets rid of the breakpoint. Let me go ahead and reload the whole page. Uh, this version here, I got a few windows open. Let me go ahead and uh, reload the page here. I'm going to go ahead and watch the console. I'm going to click Get Quote for Goog. OK, interesting. So, why is this? Not... <sighs> it's being too forgiving. Bar XHR. This should not be working. Well, it's definitely not working, but it's also not triggering the error I thought it would. All right, let me check one thing here. I've been getting a little suspicious. All right. Let's try this once more. Damn it. It is not cool. Yeah, OK. Let me try and practice what I preach. Let's see this. No, it's, wow, that's fascinating. Wow, all right, I'm going to have to crop a whole lot of video here because this is not working as I expected. Um, oh, shoot. No, I think it's OK, actually. So there's, I have to check the spec on this. So there is a dual use for var. If you declare var inside of a block of code like this, I think I'm actually making the variable global unintentionally. Um, let me think if I can simulate something slightly better than this. All right, let me try one other thing. All right, so let's roll this back to the beginning. Of course, the moment I try to make a mistake, I can't, and yet I make mistakes all the time. Let's try this here, since it's now in the handler function. All right, Goog. Damn it. All right. OK, so two for three is not bad, huh? I got cron right, yes? And I got uh, the other thing right. So I'll come up with a good error that actually simulates this properly. I swear to God, I make good mistakes all the time. So I just can't do it on demand, apparently. OK, so let me just pick up where we left off and see if I can't salvage the path that we were on here. So we were in our second example here, which was Ajax 2. And it was slightly better. And that I wasn't completely copying out and typing in some, uh, using something like an alert to populate this price field. I was actually updating the DOM itself, right? So by DOM here, I mean one of the nodes in the tree happens to be an input element. So how did I do that? Well, the setting up the placeholder for that answer was pretty trivial. So in Ajax2.html, all I did was add an additional uh, element called input. I gave it an ID for reasons we'll see in a moment. And it has a type of text. So apparently, I'm going to be accessing this field by way of one of those DOM functions, document.getElementById, properly capitalized. And in fact, that's what I'm doing. All of the code in the second example is identical to the first. The line of code I changed was this. I eliminated the copout alert call. And now I'm saying document.getElementById, quote unquote, price.value gets what? 
just the response text. And because I wrote quote one dot PHP, I know what the response is going to be. Right? It's not going to be an image. It's not going to be XML. It's just a piece of uh, string. It's a number, the price of Google. So I'm pretty comfortable just putting it in the text field there. And as an, as, um, to make clear what's been going on here, let me go ahead and open up quote one dot PHP. There's really nothing interesting in here. I just stole this from project two. The kind of code that you, you, know, you probably wrote to contact Yahoo Finance. I have a line of code with f open to open a connection. I check the handle value. I call f get CSV. I then grab the appropriate indexes and I just spit out uh, dollar sign data one, which is the default price field. So literally borrowed from project two. And I just needed a quick and dirty script that spits out a stock quote given a parameter, namely dollar sign underscore get of quote unquote symbol. So that's all that's going on there. So let's, what do you like and dislike about this approach, if anything, versus the first approach? Because right, this is actually not uncommon. People use text fields kind of a lot these days for things. Um, often, even YouTube and this, like, use text fields or text areas so that you can copy and paste like the embed tag or the URLs. So you know, they're, they're common, if inelegant. So what's, what's one positive of this approach over the alert function? Anything polite come to mind? Yeah? OK, OK, good. So we're not just using a pop-up. So it persists, actually, once the response comes back. So that's something. Uh, what don't you like now about this? What's that? Yeah, right? So if you're, you rely on this for your day trading, you know, someone could just come over here and say something like, you know, ooh, go buy 10 shares of that. And now you've just spent 4,000 extra dollars. So, you know, and plus, notice too, feels a little messy. If I can type anything I want in there, then do Yahoo, and then, OK, the value gets clobbered. But just, I don't really like user interfaces that let me put whatever I want just because it's possible. So what would you prefer to have there? What might be better than a text area? A little table or yeah, a label. I mean, there's any number of elements that are non-editable that we could use. So let's take a look at this third variant. So this is ajax23.html. Uh, and now uh, let's take a look at 3.html. So this is kind of interesting. Still ugly. right? I really focused on functionality, not beauty just yet. But now this is kind of neat, because now I kind of have a placeholder to be determined. And I'm going to blow that value away. But now I'm really integrating it much more seamlessly, if you will, sort of kayak style, into the page itself. So now let's search for Google, get quote. And an HTTP request is made. And then voila, the price comes back, not editable. And if I view the source of this page, what's interesting is that notice this is still the original source. So there is, in fact, some dynamism going on here. It's not changing the page itself. That original page came down. But this page that came down originally was loaded into memory into this thing called DOM. We then used our XML HTTP request object to go get more data. It came back. I inserted it somehow, we'll see how in a moment, into the DOM. And now that's not going to change the original source. But what did change, and this is kind of neat. <laughs> Watch this backfire on me, too. Um, I'm going to go to the HTML tab here. I'm going to go to the HTML view of this page. Let me go ahead and reload first. And notice, this is also what's nice about Firebug. If, again, you've not been using it, even if your code is a little messy because it's been dynamically generated, Firebug parses it very nicely and lets you see what's inside. This also was really how I understood how the Dining Services website was structured. Looking at their source code just gave me a headache because naturally it's just very messy because it's mostly machine generated. This is so much easier to look at and it allowed me to really understand top to bottom how the page was structured, if slightly invalidly. So I'm going to go ahead and go click Get Quote here. And now notice what happens. Firebug is showing me the DOM, not the original source. So what just changed is the price. Keep an eye on this line again down here. Let me go ahead and do like Microsoft get quote, and it's changing the DOM as well. So that too is a nice debugging trick. So how is this happening? Let's take a look. Again, there's really very little changing about this. This is my third version of this code. And notice this. This is kind of the not so standards compliant approach to updating a web page, but frankly, it's one of the easiest and it's one of the highest performing, ironically. So technically, what quote1.php is returning is text slash HTML, because that's the default MIME type for PHP if you don't specify something else with a header call. So I'm getting back HTML. There's no tags, but it's, it's HTML. It's just uh, it's PC data. 
So technically, I can just cram into the price element. Well, wait a minute, what is this price element? Let's scroll down to the HTML. Oh, this time I didn't use an input field, I used a span. I could have used a div, a span, I could use a bunch of different fields. I went with a span, just to be a little placeholder. Every element like span and div and h1, h2, anything that is designed to hold content has an inner HTML property. HTML is capitalized, doesn't matter if it's XHTML, it's still called HTML. That is the raw HTML that, or XHTML that's inside of that element. So if your AJAX call returns HTML or XHTML, you can just cram it into a DOM node replacing whatever's there by using this property. Now I say this is sort of the non-standards compliant approach because the world would generally prefer that you use these things called DOM functions and that you create new nodes, use, literally using functions like create element or create uh, or add child. It's very, very cumbersome. And also various people out there um, have done nice, very useful performance tests where if you are building a site that's not as simple as this page, but something like Kayak that returns 100 results, the reality is that it's sometimes a lot more efficient, a lot faster to generate the XHTML or HTML on the server side, ship it down to the browser via the AJAX call in response text, and just cram it into the inner HTML property instead of sending a whole bunch of very beautiful XML but very verbose XML parsing that XML in your JavaScript, then creating new DOM nodes, which we'll eventually see, and finally updating the web page. Um, that tends to be slower. And in this day of maximizing um, JavaScript performance, sometimes the inner HTML approach is by far the simplest. And I will concede, when I get around to re-implementing this interface to use, Java, uh, to use AJAX so that you don't get these full-fledged page reloads, I will very likely just put that whole right-hand part of the page in one big div, and I will update the inner HTML property of that div by just fetching a new table uh, to cram inside of there, because it's very easy, and I don't have to write a lot of JavaScript code. It's one line. So it's just a trade-off. It depends on what you're trying to optimize, your time, the server's time. Um, trying to impress someone else with standards, it really varies. But it's very, very globally supported, this approach of inner HTML. OK, a question back here first. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's just being devil's advocate You could have used read only on text Oh, yes, absolutely. I could have used read only. I could disable it to yeah. several different ways. Still looks a little ugly, though, it feels. Just to have a text area just to plop in right. some I string. Use, use but sure, other ways are possible, too. And then here. Uh-huh. So it's a good question. I actually forget the answer to this. I, this came up during break. You can absolutely have multiple AJAX calls. Let me double check the appropriate way of doing that so you don't run into race conditions using the same object. Um, so let me get back to you on that, um, only because in recent memory, the, every time I've used AJAX calls in code, it's usually to request one URL. And if I get another request overlapping it, I abort the previous call. But there is a way to send multiple requests to different destinations. But let me, hold, uh, let me double check that before misspeaking. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's there, uh, div does not have a value per se. Inputs have values. So that's technically a bit of an oversimplification because all DOM nodes have values, which is defined in XML as being the concatenation of all of their textual descendants. But in reality, divs and spans do not have values. They have inner HTML. Input types have, uh, and text areas have value. And text boxes and radio buttons have values. And that's it. Yeah, and select menus, damn. No, they don't. They don't have, no, they have different things. Selected index properties. Yeah? So on your shell boy website, um, when you updated it and you did the inner HTML um, to show the whole list of parts, are you going to be using um, response text for that? Or what do you think? Response, it, it depends. I could use response XML, but uh, I have to then send back uh, well-formed XHTML. But the catch is that response XML is automatically parsed by the browser, which I'm not going to care about, at least in this case, because I'm going to be inserting it into the inner HTML property. So odds are, and this I have to hypothesize, because the browsers might very well um, do that parsing into a DOM anyway, I'm probably just going to use response text. So the response text, like you can put line breaks and stuff 
Mm -hmm. BR text. Yeah, and in fact, I, let me see if I can force myself to do this this week, because we can then, then I can write it off as teaching time and not uh, screwing around with shuttle boy time. No, oh, so I'll show the code if, uh, if I'm able to do this this week. It's not much at all. OK, so we're getting better. It's getting a little more seamless. Let's take a look at this example here. So this is the fourth version of this. Um, let's go back to Firefox, Ajax 4. Damn, Ajax 4. OK, so now I've got this whole text box. And let's see where this is going to take us. So this is Ajax 4. Let me scroll down here. Notice I'm going to use a different file this time, quote2.php. So let's see what we're going to get back from this. Excuse me, what's the main difference here with quote two versus quote one? Getting the high and the low. How am I separating it? Apparently new lines. So I'm apparently sending back text this time. I decided I really want to send back multiple values. I'm not sophisticated enough to know how to send three distinct values and then put them different places. But I know how to send text with new line characters at the end. So notice I changed the MIME type at top, as it's called, to text plain instead of text HTML. And that means I'm going to use just new lines, not BRs, new lines, just for now. So you can probably guess what's going to happen here. If I type in Goog, what's going to appear in this text box is that quote. So it's a little better. But again, it's kind of a step backwards in that now someone can muck with this. And so it's not perfect. But clearly now, we see that Ajax is capable of sending more than just tiny little fragments of data. I can send multiple pieces. So how did I do this? Well, this code is almost identical except for its use of quote 2. This is Ajax 4. I'm going to scroll down again to the only part that's changed. And notice the only difference here is I've gone back to the dot value approach. Because result is apparently what type of element here? Or rather, the element with an ID of result is probably what? It's a text area, because that's the only other change to the document. Down here, I have a text area with some columns and some rows, and that's it. So I'm changing the value of that. All right, so let's take things up a notch further. This is the fifth variant of Ajax. This is going to be a little prettier, because notice now what I'm going to do. I have a little tacky placeholder. I now type in, um, let's say, we'll go with Yahoo this time, get quote. OK, so a little more interesting. Now we're back to the approach of integrating it a little more seamlessly. Apparently, I somehow broke lines there. So they're on separate lines. I couldn't have used backslash n for that alone, because that would not give me an HTML, the actual insertion properly. So in Ajax 5, let's see, ah, quote 3.php. So let's pause our glance at that, look at quote 3. What's different here? BR tags now. I got rid of the text plane, so it's defaulting again to text HTML. I'm now sending back actual XHTML. So what do I mean by just sending back XHTML or HTML a la Shuttle Boy's next revision? Well, literally just spitting back the XHTML that you want to cram into the DOM. So what is my AJAX code going to look like? Well, it's kind of a throwback to that previous approach. I'm going to actually use here. Uh, da -da -da. I'm going to use down here. I have this thing here, quote will appear here. This time it's a div, not a span, because it's meant to be multi line, not an inline span element. So I now use document, get element by ID, quote, inner HTML response text. So frankly, this is going to be the essence of the next revision of Shuttleboy so that I can avoid this blinking and this meta refresh approach. And just to be clear, you saw the whole page refresh. The reason for that was because of this line, just in case folks haven't seen this before. It's a little retro, but gets the job done. We have, where is it? You know it's not a good approach when you can't even find it. Oh, maybe I'm not using meta refresh. I think I'm using JavaScript and a timer. Oh, all right. My code is fancier than I remember it being. Uh, init, validate, let's see. Can I answer this question quickly? How am I reloading this page? Window dot href. Come on, I'll find it. Oh, is it at the bottom? No. Why? Damn, I don't remember my own code. This wasn't even written that long ago. Did I double check here? Wow. All right. Interesting. How? Oh, that's why. Okay. We're on the, we need to get to the page where it will bother refreshing. 
and you're actually looking at shuttle schedules. Now it will recognize that it's showing real data. So now there it is. That's what I was looking for. I was too clever for my own good. That'd be a really annoying interface if you clicked a stop, but if you wait, if it happened to cross the minute boundary, it refreshed the whole page. So that's all. This is what I meant. And I actually check the server time so that it doesn't just refresh 60 seconds later. It refreshes the number of seconds until the next toll of the clock, the next minute. That's why it's 23 instead of 60 in that case. But still, very hackish, very hackish. Don't be impressed. Be disappointed in my laziness there. So we'll fix. All right, so we now are using inner HTML. Let's take things up a little further. So Ajax 6 is a little neater in that finally we're starting to impress our friends. So in Ajax 6, notice what I did here. Goog, get quote, that's kind of cool, dot, dot, dot. And then a few seconds later, the response comes back. So this is using a different script. This is using quote 4.php because I wanted to simulate a slow connection. So there's how I simulated a slow server. I just slept for five seconds before returning the response. So that actually lets you see the dot, dot, dot. Now, what, how did this actually work? Well, I'm just thinking through logically how and when I should make these updates. So here's my quote function. And again, I'm going quickly to the code because it's almost all the same each of these times. But there's this new line. I'm first creating a URL for quote 4 instead of quote 3. But notice, before I issue the Ajax call, I dynamically update the inner HTML just to say looking up symbol, dot, dot, dot. So you, can, you don't have to use Ajax. You can just use JavaScript to manipulate the values of no, inside of nodes, the, uh, the HTML in nodes. Then I send my Ajax request. Where am I finally going to update the response? Well, in my handler as before, where I, for the second time now, clobber inner HTML. So again, very basic building blocks. We're stepping up and up and up, doing slightly more interesting things, so that now we're at the seventh revision of this thing which looks like this. Uh, this is version 7. You're going to be blown away by this version. All right, so now I'm going to search for MSFT. Get quote. That is magical. Look at that. <laughs> so I searched for the tackiest image I could find. Uh, that is just an animated GIF. Incidentally, if you Google Ajax progress indicators, you'll get to this site, ajaxload.info, which made this site where you can choose from a drop down any number of tacky progress bars. I think, yep, there's the one I chose, the biggest one I could find. And then you can actually change the colors of it. Background will be, let's say, ooh, that's a cool new feature, yellow. And then the foreground color, how about purple? And now I'll close that, generate it, and you can make your own little progress bar using this site. So I've actually generated slightly prettier ones using this site because they let you download them then for free. So how did we do this? Well, again, even though tonight's mostly about Ajax, this is now JavaScript stuff, showing and hiding animated GIFs. We kind of did that already. So let's, let's take a look. This is Ajax 7. I'm querying quote 4 again, so no change there. I wanted the slow quote 4 uh, server to pretend like I was, uh, it was a slow connection. Notice this trick. I'm apparently getting the element whose ID is progress. I'm changing its CSS style, the display property, to be block thereby revealing where it always sh apparently is. Because if I scroll down to my XHTML, notice that I have an image tag in here. It is right inside of this. So notice these lines of code here. ID is progress, but style has a property of none, which means put it here, but don't show it to me, thereby hiding it effectively. And then I just have the image itself with a little alt attribute. So I'm just toggling this, just like I did with Harvard events, toggling every other row. And as an aside, those of you more savvy with CSS might know that there's also a visibility property. Notice that if I did this, um, visibility equals hidden. There's some asymmetries in CSS. It's apparently hidden instead of none uh, or something like that. And then let's see, I don't change it to none. What's the opposite of visible, visible not of hidden? Is it visible? OK. I rarely use this one. So there's one difference, which is useful to know. Let me reload this page. Notice that uh, that's not what I wanted. Visibility is hidden. Uh, oh, yes. Well, OK. But that line of code should not have executed anyway yet. But you're right. Visibility. I think it's visibility. Yes? No, something's broken. 
Visibility. Well, oh, CSF visib. Yeah, visibility. Okay. Visibility hidden, and then the opposite is. Uh, I guess inherit would work too. Visible though, that works. Okay. Visibility. That's wrong. Okay. That's correct though. Oh, visibility. Okay, visible, visible. Hey, you're not the one being filmed and being stared at by people. Okay, that's correct. Yes, visibility. I'm not this dumb. Okay. Okay, but this is not behaving as I expected it would. So I got to stop doing demos on the fly. No more questions. Um, so, oh, hmm. Visibility hidden. Visible. This is correct. Oh, wait, that's why. We didn't change this. All right, that's your fault. You should have told me about that. OK, visibility equals, I want to make it visible. And now down here, once it comes back, oh, wow, we re I really butchered this, hidden. We want to make it hidden again. OK, Whew. still not what I wanted, but oh, no, this is what I wanted. OK, OK, so the difference between the whole point of this stupid exercise was to make this point. The difference between the display property and the visibility property, for those unfamiliar, is that the display property, when it's set to none, means that the element takes up no space, which means the, there is uh, no placeholder for that element. Visibility, though, makes the problem a little uglier in that it reserves all of the space that that huge GIF would take up. It just doesn't show it to you. Now, it depends on your goal as to whether or not you want this effect or the previous effect, but do realize those two distinctions. Typically, uh, I think you'll find that the display property is more commonly used. Um, but after some trial and error, you can also use the visibility property to also achieve the same thing, which might actually be a plus if you don't want your GUI, your interface, jumping up and down, up and down, just because you're displaying some graphic. For my simple approach, though, I was OK with this thing appearing like that suddenly and then jumping back. But that's the difference. And that's actually a useful distinction to be aware of. So we're almost there. We now have an animated progress bar, which kind of borrows some ideas from last week, mashes them together with this week. What more remains? Well, let's take a look at ajax8.html. So this is uh, a version that's going to embed a few different things. But now I have placeholders. So this is neat, because before I kind of had to prefab all of the content on the server and then cram it into my web page preformatted. What if, much more commonly these days, a la Kayak and Google and the like, what if I want to put different pieces of data in different places? I could issue three AJAX calls. Feels a little wasteful, feels like a lot of HTTP overhead if I can get them all at once and just grab different pieces of the response. So that's what's going to happen here. When I search for Google and click Get Quote, what I actually get this time is the answer, but it's going to be plopped in here and here and here without clobbering previous values like price low and high. So this is AJAX 8. Let me take a look at this source. Let's first look at the XHTML. There are my placeholders. And this, this is sort of canonical AJAX code if you, wanna, if you know where you want to put the data. So Kayak, admittedly, much fancier than we're doing here. For now, we're just trying to insert some values here and there. But notice I have three spans, all of which have IDs, which means I can get them with the DOM function called get document ele uh, get element by ID. So now if I scroll up, I got a little more code now. Because let's take a look at what's being returned. The, ver the URL I'm hitting is now quote 5.php. So you have a printout of this too. Quote 5.php looks like this. And now notice, what am I returning apparently here? Yeah, this is actually XML. Notice my MIME type is text XML. Notice I've apparently spitting out a quote element with a symbol attribute, a price child, a high child, a low child, and then close tag. So this is sort of David Malin's arbitrary XML format, which is completely my and now your prerogative to format your data however you see fit. I've just semantically tagged the various features with some metadata. Because now I can use things like XPath, if it exists in JavaScript, does, but with library support. Or I can just use what are called DOM functions. And these are the functions I promised we'd glanced at. So let's see what the response is coming back as. First, I'm going to go and use my little sniffing tool. Live HTTP headers, I'm going to re-query the same data so that I can see this URL. So quote 5.php, question mark, symbol equals goog. I'm going to copy that because I want to see my XML for a second. Hit Enter, 
this is what's now coming back. So if you, a few years ago when Ajax was all capitalized, literally, and the X stood for XML, this is what the world meant. Return XML from the server and use JavaScript to parse it and display what pieces you want. We haven't even got, we haven't done any of the X in Ajax until right now, because frankly it's a little annoying, as you're about to see, and we'll conclude probably with a glance at JSON, which is something we'll continue to use a bit more, because it's a little, it's definitely lighter weight, um, and it's also just so much easier to navigate in JavaScript code. But here's the magic in Ajax 8. When I get back my response, notice one difference first, I grab not response text, but response XML, because I want back a parsed DOM. That assumes that I'm returning XML that is well formed, otherwise bad things will happen. And now this is where, this is useful to know, and it's good to know how to do this, but you can see already the verboseness vis-a-vis -vis the previous approaches. So what am I doing here? I'm getting get elements by tag name, give me all of the price elements. But I know there's only going to be one price element, so I do a sanity check for that, because I wrote quote 5.php, then I want to declare a variable called price, so I get the zeroth price, because there should be only one of them, dot first child dot node value. So again, you're seeing hints of that discussion way back when of DOM nodes having children, children having values. So all of that's coming back, and again, the capitalization is important. Finally, once I get that value price, then I use my inner HTML property. And there's actually, I'm kind of mixing inner HTML with DOM functions here. There are ways to create a new DOM node out of that price and insert it, but for now I've kept it a little simpler. The rest of the file is pretty much the same. The high and the low, same exact syntax. But the new takeaways are this function called get elements by tag name. It's actually pretty useful. It does what it says. Um, and this ability to traverse the nodes in a DOM, but notice that it's not sufficient to grab the child node with dot first child. You have to dive deeper to get its actual value, just as you do with an input element. So this is, again, the traditional XML with AJAX. But in AJAX 9.xml, or .html, we have this flavor. So we have, actually I'm going to skip 9, because 9 just shows you in a text area what I showed you with the uh, live HTTP headers. Let's take a look at AJAX 10. So AJAX 10 looks at quote 6.php. This is what quote 6.php returns. Apparently a text file. And let me open that. That's slightly annoying. Open that. Here it is. If you've ever wondered what JSON is, this is JSON. So JSON, JavaScript object notation, returns an object, um, an object and or an array. So remember the square bracket notation for arrays from the past two weeks, curly braces for objects, that's what you're getting back. You're getting back a hash table, key value pairs. So it's very similar in spirit to XML. It can be hierarchical if one key's value is another hash table, some of whose value is a hash table. So you can still have hierarchy and nesting, but it's a lot more concise. No open tags, closed tags, and all of that messy metadata. And syntactically, you'll see in a second, so much easier to navigate than all of that first child, the node value, and all of that mess. But just notice what's come back. An object, because of the curly braces. The commas denote different keys. So there's three different keys, each of whose value is just a number. So I've spit back some JSON code. How did I do this? Well, this is again Ajax, uh, sorry, this is quote six. So quote six looks like this. I actually did this manually. And we'll see a cleaner way in a moment. I just, I know what, Ajax, uh, I know what JSON is. I can write this myself. And I did, literally, at the bottom of this file. So I spit it out, but notice I changed my MIME type to application JSON, just because that's kind of the way you're supposed to do it. And that's why the browser triggered this pop-up. Pop you can get away with text slash JavaScript, text slash plain, but again, if we're trying to practice what we preach, this is the good MIME type to use. So in Ajax 10 then, how do I navigate this? Oh, uh, I'm doing, I'm finish, uh, filling in the blank from before using these DOM functions. So what do I do? So this is the trick via which you can convert a JSON string, which happens to represent an object, to an actual JavaScript object. It's a little ugly looking, but you literally call the eval function. You then concatenate an open paren and a closed paren around response text. So this is, again, something you just kind of copy and paste when you want to convert a JSON string into the actual in-memory representation of it. And at this point in the story, my variable called quote is a structure in memory, a JavaScript object containing three keys, each of which has one value, which is precisely what we just saw. Now, I mentioned before you can create DOM nodes. 
and I decided to do that here, notice if I don't want to take this uh, sort of um, unpopular, somewhat unpopular approach of using inner HTML, there are other DOM functions out there. Create element of type div with the name of div, create text node with some value, append child, append child. Those are the functions that I alluded to. And these are good to know, and this is very common, but performance-wise, this tends to underperform pre-generating your XHTML on the server or simply cramming things into inner HTML. And frankly, it's just kind of annoying, I think, to have to write, especially in a context which is meant to lower the bar to programming so often nowadays, all of these functions just to accomplish something simple that previously we were accomplishing with one line. So we have just one last example here, a mm, Ajax 12, because 11 is just a debugging thing. So Ajax 12 ultimately does the same thing. So Ajax 12.html. I'm going to go ahead and type in uh, Google, get quotes. I get back the answer. But what's nice in AJAX 12 is I'm using, again, one of these libraries. So YUI has a connection library. I copied and pasted the appropriate script tags up there. And what's really nice about this is that all of that JSON, all of that AJAX code, all of the try, catch, the new, the XML, HTTP request, all of that messiness gets reduced to just one function call, <laughs> yahoo.util.connect.async request. I specify the get um, method. I specify the URL. I then specify using this object notation what function I want called upon success. And this is per YUI's documentation. And then I just copied and pasted my handler function from before. But this time it takes an input, an object, which I called O. And inside of O is response text. And jQuery and other libraries have very similar mechanism. So what's really nice about JSON data these days is that it's it, many, many libraries exist for it. And we'll see ways of actually taking an arbitrary PHP object or associative array, so long as there's no weird cycles or graphs that you're constructing in memory, you can call one function, JSON encode. That will take your PHP object or array, convert it to a JSON string, which you can then respond to the client with instead of manually typing it out as I did at the bottom of quote six. There are libraries in many different languages for doing this. This is just an excerpt from JSON's own website. So using this in the context of project three, will ultimately be, as you'll see in section, um, and we'll talk more next week too, boils down to using JSON encode in your PHP code, using eval on your JavaScript code, and voila, you have a nice coordination between client and server. And thanks to libraries like YUI, can you really simplify the code further? So without further ado, I'll turn you over to Sid if you're sticking around, and otherwise, I will see you next week.